Colton, how did you get so lucky? You just fell into it, right? Pure luck. Man, she killed it, didn't she? Okay, good morning. I was ready to get up here. I didn't realize she was going to sing. And I'm so glad that I didn't get up here so that she could sing because I was blessed by that. I hope that uh, each one of y'all are. I know that uh, as we open God's Word, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 11 today, the first 10 verses. And today we're talking about expecting hope. And in Isaiah, it just makes sense since he was a prophet that he prophesied the coming Messiah that it's hope revealed. 700 years before Christ was born, the prophet Isaiah reveals to us the hope that is certain for us that we will see in that day that Christ returns for us and we will be with Him for eternity. Until that time, we know that it's going to happen. We wait for that. I don't know about you, but I'm not a very good waiter. Um, I like to have things right now. I like to open up the Christmas presents in my family growing up, we used to badger my mother uh, into letting us open one gift before Christmas. Man, that was the best day. We would go and we'd shake the boxes and we would try to figure out what was in there and which gift was going to be the best gift because no kid wanted to open up and get clothes on that early, opening, that early present opening day. And so if it rattled a little bit, then we would know man, this is not clothes. If it rustled, you knew that it was clothes because they had that, that white paper in there and all that kind of stuff. I think my mother got smart because sometimes she started stuffing boxes with paper and they wouldn't sound at all. And we just had to guess. But you know, with the hope of Christ returning, there is no guessing. We know the present is coming. We know the gift is there. And we know what it will be if we trust and put our hope in Christ. We know that we will not be disappointed. I had a boss when I was on active duty in my, my last uh, active duty assignment teaching Air Force ROTC. He used to tell me, Major Tucker, hope is not a plan. Because he would ask, are, are we ready for graduation? Are we ready for commissioning? Are we ready for, for whatever? And, and being the good American, I go, I sure hope so. And he'd go, Major Tucker, hope is not a plan. We have to know. And in our American society, you know what we do? We, we use that word hope to mean I sure, I think it's going to happen, but I'm not quite sure. Like you might be looking forward to your family coming home, but in this day of COVID, you don't know. I sure hope my son gets to come home, but I don't know if he's going to get to. In fact, we found out last night that he's not going to get to come home. He's over in Albuquerque and... He's not going to be able to make it for Christmas, so now he's pushing it out to January. So you think, well, that hope was disappointed. But when we talk about our hope in Christ, we will never be disappointed. And we need to reorient our minds and, and think of these things uh, rather than thinking, boy, I sure hope I'm going to heaven, like I'm not really sure, but you go, my hope is in heaven and I know that I'll be there one day. Words matter. And on this, this uh, eve, as we move forward to uh, celebrating the birth of Christ, we need to grab hold of the hope that is certain in Him. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter about an election. It doesn't matter about a virus. It doesn't matter that, unfortunately, my son won't be able to make it home for Christmas. What matters is that he has a hope that is certain in Christ. What matters is that you have a hope that is certain in Christ. What matters is that no virus can take that hope away from you. No election can dampen that hope. Nothing on this world can take you out of the grip of grace if you've given your life to Jesus and you know that he is coming back for you again one day. And so in, in, of all people across this globe, Christians have a hope that is undimmed, that is unfading, that is absolute. And so the question comes, why is it we act as if we are hopeless? Why do we act sometimes like the world is going to end and that's a bad thing? 
Why do we fret over things that really are not eternal and wonder, what am I going to do tomorrow? When you've been given a mission, you have a hope. You get up the next day and you say, Lord, I'm going to go serve you. How good is that? When we walked in the door, I think I told you there was a lady that said, I'm so glad to be here. I said, I am too. We get to be here. Well, tomorrow when we wake up, we get to go tell people about Jesus. Tomorrow when we get up, we get to live out a life that witnesses for Him because our hope is certain. So today, as we expect hope, let's look at hope revealed from the prophet Isaiah. Now, the prophet Isaiah was a prophet in uh, Judah from 740 B.C. to 701 B.C. He, he uh, was a prophet through the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and it's believed that uh, Hezekiah's son Manasseh uh, martyred him in 701 B.C., which by incident was also when the nation of Judah was taken into captivity. When God finally said, enough is enough, you, you've been disobedient long enough, it is time for you to leave the Holy Land. It is time to lose your inheritance that I have given you. See, he prophesied Judah's fall. He also prophesied Israel's fall. We looked at that last week. He told Ahaz, who was not a good king, he said, listen, don't be worried about these guys camped out on your front door. They're going to be gone pretty soon. The fathers revealed to, to me that they're going to be taken into captivity, that they're not going to be a problem for you anymore. He always spoke of a remnant. In fact, his son, Shear Jashub, back in chapter 7, his name meant a remnant shall remain. And here you're going to see, uh, if you read on in, verse, in chapter 11, that it begins to talk about a remnant. But Isaiah always gave the nation of Israel hope. Because see, God's promises are absolute. He's never forgotten his nation Israel. He's never forgotten the promises that He's made to them. Just like He's never forgotten the promises that He's made to you. To each one of you. I wish we could do interactive. I wish I could have you raise your hands and I could call on you. And I'd say, what promises are you holding on to in this Christmas season? What promises bring you hope? What promises bring you comfort? Is it the promise that Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I will never forsake you? Is it the promise that says... All of your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Is it the promises where he says, I will supply all of your needs out of my riches and glory? Is it the promises that he says, I have prepared a place for you in heaven? And if I've prepared a place for you, I'm certainly returning for you that where I am, you may be also. Is it the promise where he says, I always hear what you say. Come to me with your cares and your burdens, and I'll listen. Is it the promise that he tells us that when we're weak, that he'll be strong? Which promise are you holding on to? Because I can tell you, you don't have to say, I sure hope Jesus hears my, hears my cry. You know he hears it. Because his hope is certain. Isaiah promised a remnant would remain. And one always has. And then Isaiah promised or prophesied the Messiah. He prophesied that God would send a Savior to redeem us, to purchase us, to make us whole. If you would, please stand in honor of reading God's Word as we read the first ten verses of chapter 11 of Isaiah. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Words are on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you or you don't have your phone or your electronic device, but here we go. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of, Je of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. 
Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt around his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. Also, a cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. You may be seated. In order to understand this fully, we need to understand the plight of the people, God's people. Now, the first is, that you're going to see is that they were the disobedient. It's unfortunate, but from the moment they started coming out of Egypt, they just wouldn't listen to God. They just had this penchant for running away from him. They build a golden idol at the Mount Sinai when he's getting the Ten Commandments up on the mountain when Moses is up there. They, they complain about being thirsty and he brings water from a rock. They're worried about the Egyptians and he sp splits the, the Red Sea. I mean, the nation of Israel started out complaining and whining and being disobedient. And even when they went into the land, when uh, Joshua leads them in to take the Holy Land, the Promised Land, after they've wandered for 40 years in the desert because of their disobedience. They didn't fully clear out the land as God had told them to do. They weren't fully obedient in taking the land that he had promised them. And, and, and consequently, people were left in the land that led the people astray, that, that uh, led them to um, foreign gods and, and to uh, worship in a different manner and to, to have their sons and their daughters uh, walk through the fire. And you can read all about it. It was just... They followed this pattern of disobedience. And it got worse when the kingdom was split. Eventually, David builds up the kingdom. His son Solomon takes it to greater glory. And then at some point, Solomon turned away from the Lord and became apostate. He, re he returned back in, in his last years. But in 1 Kings, I want to say it was 1 Kings 12... It's prophesied to Solomon. He said, listen, the kingdom is going to be ripped away from you. It's going to be split. And we know that when Solomon's son Rehoboam takes over, that happens. The people revolt. Ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. The northern kingdom is called Israel or Ephraim as you read through uh, Isaiah. And the southern kingdom was Judah. And in that moment, their disobedience began to, to multiply began to build upon itself. And so they were the disobedient. And the thing is, they had God's Word. In Deuteronomy it said, if you will follow my commands, if you'll do what I say, I will bless you. I will provide for you. I will, your enemies will flee from you. And then it says, but when you are disobedient, when you fall, he says, then your enemies will, will uh, defeat you. The land will not support you. And eventually I'm going to kick you out of it. I mean, God promised all of these things to him, to them. And they just didn't listen. I'm afraid in America today that we've become, in many ways, the disobedient because we, we become comfortable listening to the fact that, well, if your sins have been forgiven, you're going to heaven. And, and if you think about it, how many of us have ever said, and I, I'm putting myself in this because when I was younger, I used to say that, well, at least I have my fire insurance. That usually followed something that you knew you were doing that was wrong. God will not be mocked. And he made sure that the nation of Israel knew that. His people. Now remember, there's always a remnant. God is always faithful. But he promised them when you were disobedient that these things would happen. So you begin to see that the nation is not only disobedient, but they become the defeated. Where they used to walk into a battle and their enemies would flee in all directions. Now, they would walk into the battle and their enemies would have their way with them. 
If you go into 1 Samuel and begin to read about the downfall, the loss of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was at Shiloh, and the nation of Israel goes out to fight against their enemies, the Philistines, and the Philistines have their way. They just destroy them. And so they go, we're going to go back and get the Ark of the Covenant of God. We're going to bring it into the camp, and he's going to be with us, and he's going to fight our battles for us. And they lost again, and they lost the Ark. Now, it's really pretty funny what happens to the Philistines with the Ark in their possession. Go read that. But they were trusting in God, but they were not living for him. They wanted him to show up and protect them, but they didn't want to live by the commands that he had given them. They didn't want to follow the guidelines that he had set before them. And Jesus said, listen, my commands are not burdensome. They're not difficult. They're not hard. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. When, the, when the, uh, Jesus is talking to the young man, the young lawyer, he says, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it goes on to say, all of the law and the prophets are fulfilled in these two commands. Church, if we would just love each other the way God intends us to love, we would never fall and, and, and mess up a command of God. We wouldn't have trouble. But the nation of Israel, they sat there and they, they became the defeated. God had removed his hand from them. And as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, the Assyrians and the Babylonians come and they take them into captivity. They become the dispersed. The northern kingdom of Israel goes into captivity in 722 B.C. And the southern kingdom of Judah goes into captivity at 701. You can read about the advance of the armies against the, the southern kingdom in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 28 through 32, and then Isaiah 10, 33 and 34. God brings destruction on those that would harm Israel, but He still allowed Israel to be destroyed or Judah to be taken into captivity. See, you had the disobedient, the defeated, the dispersed, and the dejected. And in my few years of pastoring a church, my iPad is talking to me. It is. In my few years of pastoring a church, I've seen people walk into my office disobedient, disobedient, defeated, dispersed. They felt like they had no place and dejected. Folks, as a Christian, because of the hope we have in Christ, we should never be that way. We should never be that way. We have a God that says, I've come to take up residence in your heart. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never let you go. You will be mine forever. And I will come for you one day. But 700 years before Christ came, this hope was revealed to a people that were disobedient, that were defeated, that were dejected, and that had been dispersed. That God is not done with you. He's not finished. A remnant will return. So let's look at the person of the Messiah that we find in Isaiah chapter 11. As we begin to look at this, we see the first thing that we look at is his ancestry. You, you remember that David was told that a descendant of his would always be on the throne. And that descendant seemed to be all the way through Solomon. Solomon was son of David. And then Jeroboam was son of Solomon. And at least in the southern kingdom, that line lasted for a little bit. And then because of their disobedience, they're, they're taken out of the land. But still, the promise of God was that a descendant would, would be on the throne of David forever. And so you see here in verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of, De of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. David's promise that somebody from his line would always be on the throne. When you go to Matthew chapter 1 and you begin to look at the, the genealogy of Christ as it's laid out, that is intended to show the, the people of Israel in that day that Christ came specifically from the line of David, that he fulfilled the prophecy made 700 years before that he would come from the stem of Jesse, that he would be of the house of David, and then as you go through and you begin to look at 
the different uh, verses in uh, the New Testament. You can go to Romans 1.3. Paul is writing his letter to the Romans and he starts out and he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What did he promise? He promised in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Paul recognized that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, the elders are sitting around and John is, is in that vision that has been given to him of the end of times. And it says that in that throne room of God, a book is brought in, a scroll is brought in. And the question is asked, who is worthy to open the scroll, to break the seal? And in verse 5 of chapter 5 of Revelation, it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping, because the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And so the ancestry of Christ is certain. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy that a son of David would sit on the throne forever. 700 years before he ever came, the prophet Isaiah told the nation this. How cool is that? How neat is that? And here we are, some 2,000 and change, past that. Almost 3,000 years ago, Christ was prophesied to be of the house and the line of David. And then not only that, but you see that He is the promised Redeemer. The one who would come to purchase you. There's no other word that redeemer can mean. A redeemer comes and purchases you from the chains that you're, in shackle, that you're shackled with. He comes and takes you out of the bondage that you are under. He pays the price for your sins. There is no other word that we can get out of that word redeemer. And you go to chapter 9 of Isaiah and the verses 1 through 7. He says, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. That's, that's a prophecy that Christ would come out of that part of the, the country. And you know, the saying was in, in Jerusalem or in Israel at that time, nothing good comes out of this part of the country. Nothing good can come from Nazareth. Nazareth. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor is at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tolment and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire." There will be no more wars. For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So not only does he fulfill the, the prophecy of being from the line of David, but he also fulfills the prophecy of being a redeemer, of being our Savior, of being the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach Megid in Hebrew. The Messiah, the King. Jesus fulfills that. His ancestry is absolutely certain. And then we see his anointing. Now, anointing is, is, in this day and age, is not just somebody pouring oil over your head, but it was, it was identifying you for a specific task. It was saying that you were set apart. A lot of times when we ask the Lord to anoint a mission trip, we're asking him to give his blessing to it, set it apart so that it will be successful. When I became uh, an ordained preacher, they came and they put oil over me and they said, we are anointing you to preach the gospel. When you became a deacon, chances are somebody put oil over you and anointed you and said, you are anointed or set apart for this ministry. 
And here in Isaiah, we see that he is set apart. He's anointed to be the Messiah. And as the Messiah, God gives him power and wisdom, unlimited power and wisdom. Look at verses, uh, verses 2 here. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Right there, you see that God has anointed him to be everything that we would ever need him to be in a Messiah. Wisdom, counsel, understanding, strength, all of the things that he's setting them aside to be. We saw that in the person of Jesus that walked on this earth, but we will see it even more in the person of Jesus that will return as a conqueror. Hope revealed in Isaiah is hope certain in the days when Christ calls us home. So his ancestry is certain, his anointing is certain. He prophesies about his administration in chapter, in verses 3 through 5. He says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. He's not going to go off on his own. He's going to be in concert with what the Father tells him to do. He's going to, he's going to judge based on what your actions are, not what he just sees, not what you might be able to misconstrue or what somebody might say about you, but he's going to know for certain, and he's going to administer that righteously and with justice. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. His administration is going to be perfect. It's going to be right. Look at Psalm 2, verses 9. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have stalled my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decrees of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And then he says in this uh, anointing and in this administration, he says, You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, when I talk about him ruling with justice and with righteousness, there's a scene in heaven. It says, And the heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are on a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with the robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not only is his ancestry certain, but his anointing is clear and his administration will be just and righteous. And in that last day, if you've ever worried about somebody that's ever done anything to you, God is going to take care of it. Not only is he perfect love, but he's perfect justice. Isaiah is promising us that. He's giving us a, a, a reveal into who Christ is and who he's going to be. And that he is going to rule justly with righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Man, that's something to look forward to. We need to have hope in Christ that we, his church, will live for him looking forward to that hope. So not only do we see his ancestry, his anointing, his administration 
But then we see his accomplishments. When Christ comes again, and that's what we're really talking about is when Christ comes again, he's going to usher in an era of peace that we can't even fathom. He says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When he returns, when that hope is realized, creation will be as it was intended. Now, it sounds like he's just talking about a farmyard there and maybe the backwoods. But he's painting a picture of what creation was intended to be from the very beginning. You know, sin didn't always mar the earth. There was a time in the Garden of Eden when God finished His creation and He looked around and He said, it is very good. He only said it was very good after He created man. There was a time in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were without sin. And they walked through and they talked with God in the cool of the morning and they spent time with Him. And then sin entered into the world and it broke the world. What Isaiah is prophesying here, the hope that is to be revealed, is that one day we will look forward to that perfect time when peace will reign, when the world will be as it was intended to be. As we sit under His administration, as we sit under His government as we see his accomplishments all of these things as we read through verses uh, 6 through uh, 9 were in present tense they weren't in the tense of what is to come they were in present tense and you have to scratch your head what does that mean it can only mean this that God is saying this is what is going to be in fact it's already happened we just have to get to that point We have to realize that. We have to understand that God knows all that will come and He is saying, listen, this is what is going to happen when my son takes up his rule and his reign in a new heaven and a new earth. A restored creation. And once again, nature will be in harmony. And all will be as it should be. And all the nations will rally to him. Look at the last verse in this passage. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. So Isaiah reveals to us the ancestry, the anointing, the administration, and then his accomplishments. Not in full, obviously, but enough that we get a picture of who Christ is. And enough that we should understand that Jesus is the beginning of that fulfillment when He came 2,000 years ago as a baby. And He finished the work that God gave Him 33 years later on a cross. And He ascended into heaven and said, I'm going to come back for you one day. He says, church... You need to be waiting for me. You need to be ready. And so we see the hope of the church today is grounded in the Word of God back then and in the truth that we've seen unfolded since. So what is the hope of the church today? How is it that we're supposed to act? This is the good part, by the way. This is the part we get to really rejoice over. This is the so what of the message. Expecting hope, hope revealed. The first thing is, church, we need to be amazed at His love. Have you thought about that recently? That God would come for me 
Seldom will one man give his life for another, yet for a good man, some would even dare to die. But while I was a sinner and while you were a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. And we can even see that in that moment that, that 2,000 years ago when he was on that cross, that it was the love that held him there. It was his love and obedience to the Father and his love for you and I that put him on that cross and he became our Redeemer. But it goes even further than that. If you look at Psalm 139 when he says, every one of your days is written in a book before one ever came to be, then before the world ever was, God knew that he would send his son for you and I so that we could have eternal life. And before that, before the world even was, before, before he even created anything, God knew that when he created this earth, he was going to have to send his son. That boggles my mind. I'm amazed at his love for you and I. I'm amazed at what he did. And church, we need to return to that amazement. If you know that that hope is certain, you get up tomorrow and you go, man, God, I'm so glad you love me. I'm so glad you love me. Help me to love you back. Help me to live for you. So we need to be amazed at his love. We need to be awaiting his call. We need to be awaiting his call. God, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? Who do I get to tell about Jesus? Who do I get to show love to? What is it you want me to do? And not only that, but there's a, a call where he's going to call us home one day. Lord, until that time, let me be faithful. Until that time, help me to show love to others about. Until that time, let your love shine through me. Too many people, I mean, we need to be awaiting this call, but I'm not telling you that you should be delaying your actions. Because each and every morning you can wake up. God, what do you want me to do today? So be amazed at his love this Christmas season. And be awaiting his call for whatever he wants you to do in the day that you're, uh, that you're walking. Because the next thing is we need to be acting on his behalf. We need to be acting on his behalf. If you go back to the plight of the nation of Israel, part of their problem was they weren't acting in concert with what God's commands were. They weren't doing what God called them to do. But church, because we have had the Messiah revealed to us, because you have something that the nation of Israel didn't have, you have the king taking up residence within your heart. You have the Holy Spirit coming and, and showing you what it is you need to do and how you need to change and where you need to go and how you need to understand His Word. Then we need to be acting on His behalf. Especially in this time when the world is hopeless. You look at people and they're wringing their hands over the coronavirus and, and they're wringing their hands over an election <laughs> God's the one that puts kings in place. God's the one that uh, ordains the nations. God's the one that orders the steps. We need to be acting on His behalf. Okay, God, where do my steps need to go? And the final thing is, all of this hinges on the fact you need to be assured of His return. See, if you ever say, I sure hope He's coming back, well, you're acting like the world. My hope is he is coming back. And if he is coming back, then he is coming for me. What a glorious day that's going to be. What a good day that's going to be. And when he comes and finds me, I had better be ready. Now y'all can laugh at this. Jesus uses it as an example. Like the virgins who had oil for their lamps, I better be ready. Like the servants that he had given talents to, I better be able to hand it back to him with more than double. Like those 
whom he says, too much is given, much is required. I need to fulfill the promise that God has put in me. And so do you. And so can you. If you understand that that hope is certain and you are assured of His return, if God is for you, who can be against you? What can a virus do to you? Nothing. What can a government do to you? Nothing. Because they can't take you out of the grip of God's hand. They can't take you away from Him. They can't take your salvation. Listen, if you're not expecting hope in this Christmas season, fall on your knees and start talking to God. God, I got to have you. I got, I need you. For the life of me, I cannot understand. Well, I, I can't make that statement. I know in my time, in my life, there have been times when I felt hopeless and without God. But God has always shown up and brought me back to where I needed to be. And I, I have a hard time understanding people that go years and years and years without hope who call themselves Christians. Make it right. Make it certain. Know for sure that when you give your life to Him, it's His. He loved you enough to die for you, even with all your faults and your sins. And when that hope was given to you, with your sins removed as far as the east is from the west, that hope was revealed in your heart at that very moment that yes, Jesus, one day I'm coming home to you. This Christmas, let's be amazed at His love. Let's be awaiting His call and let's be acting on His behalf because we're assured of His return. And church, the world will be changed if His people would just follow Let's follow. Amen? Our hope is revealed in the risen Christ because He's coming again empowered like the, the words on the screen say. I for one want to be ready. I for one want to be expecting. I for one am looking forward to it. Father, as we close this time, as we uh, end, I pray, Lord, that what people have heard is a message of hope. So long ago, even before the prophet Isaiah, you were, your son was being prophesied that he would come, that he would rule over the nations, that he would bring justice, that he would take those that are his and hold on to them. And Lord, we saw 2,000 years ago that he fulfilled the promise of coming and living as a child and dying on a cross so that we could have a restored relationship with you. And Lord, I'm, I'm afraid that in our culture in our society today, we've allowed the fears of, of the secular world to override the certainty of the hope that we have in you. Father, I pray that in each heart that's here today that fear would no longer reign, but that certainty would overwhelm, that you would be so evident in, in people's lives that they would wake up and, and look for your presence, that, that if they've just tasted just a little bit that you're good, that they would desire that more and more each and every day. And that as we see that hope revealed within us and we understand your love for us and we recognize your promises to us and we understand your desire for us and as we live out the commands that you've given us and we tell the world about you, Lord, we know that you will be glorified and honored and that your name will be lifted up. Father, I pray that you would do that in this church. I pray that you would do that in this city. I pray that you would do that through us in this state and wherever we may go, we carry that hope that is certain within us. We know, Lord, that you're never going to leave us and you're never going to forsake us and that, Lord, we need to be about the business that you've called us to be about. Lord, I pray that we would see you in a new light today, that we would 
recognize once again the, the joy of our salvation, that we would understand the hope that is found in you, that nothing can take us away from you. And that, Lord, the world may try to kill us. They, they can hurt or harm our flesh, but they cannot take our soul. And so, Lord, we just pray that we would walk, that we would be strong and courageous, that we would love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we would love one another as ourselves, that we would live out the commands that you've given us, that we would tell others about you and be the witnesses that we're to be, and that, Lord, you would be pleased. And that on that day that you return, we would all hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. But until that day, give us the strength to persevere. Give us the, the, the desire to go and tell others. Help us, Lord, to uh, see the purpose that you have for our lives. And that, that we are uniquely equipped, each one of us, to fulfill a certain purpose that you have for us. Lord, help us to, to live for you each and every day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.